Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back. Yes, we have a regular podcast episode of Interstage Window today. Say hi, Landon. Uh Uh-oh. Wait, hang on. I can't Uh hear you. Oh, they can hear you, but I couldn't hear you. My headphone went weird for a second. Never mind. They all heard you say hi. Just I didn't. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I'm still not hearing you, but I can see that they are. Talk again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I can just say a whole bunch of stuff and you, oh, okay. Never. Okay. Yeah. No, I think we're okay now. It's <laughs> caught up. I don't know. Something went weird with my headphone. All right. So yeah. Oh my gosh. Hi. Welcome back, Landon. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to be back. It's been so long. Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay. So um, as you guys know, we've been spending this year reading the whole Twilight series and we do have another Twilight episode for you guys today. It's a sort of little interlude episode. Um, Hey, oh my gosh, welcome in Possum. Yes, you are first today. But uh, nobody's redeemed the actual like first. So that could be you, my friend. That could be you. Um, Also, can I just say that I love your name? Possums are one of my favorite animals. So that is all. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yes. And his name is Uneducated Possum. That's the full full name. Even better. Yeah. (laughs) This possum's too cool for school. (laughs) So, yeah, we have a little bit of an interlude for you guys. Um, Landon, what is it that we're going to be talking about today? We are going to be talking about the Eclipse novella, the second short or the short second life of Brie Turner. Uh, Tanner, Tanner, almost. I keep messing up that name. Poor girl. Uh, (laughs) Which is, I know. Which is uh, all about Brie Tanner, a young girl. We'll get into the summary of it, but a young girl that is taking place during the book of Eclipse. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a little bit confusing, but we're going to talk about it and it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to show you guys the, the beautiful deck. We're going to move to that screen. So there we go. You guys can see that. But yeah, this, this one's an interesting one because not only was it like... Um, you know, something I really didn't have a lot of experience with, which was uh, typical. It's been typical so far for us for Twilight. But Landon, you yeah. also didn't have a lot of experience with this novella, did you? No, I never read this novella until we read it for the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So Crazy. all you knew was um, was things that you had learned through like Twilight fandom osmosis. You'd never actually read it, right? Well, it came out at, a, at a, such a weird time. Uh, this novella came out prior to breaking dawn Mm -hmm. but like very much way after like the surge in popularity of eclipse so twilight at that point even though the movies were extremely popular the book fandom was on its way down Mm -hmm. when the book came out as a novella and then doesn't have any well doesn't have any of the main cast of our characters and has very little of the side characters in a, of yeah. Eclipse. Yeah. So it it was like most of the fandom didn't touch on this. Yes. Uh, and and we'll talk about that like here's when we talk about Stephanie Meyer's writing why she put this out. But yeah. it's a it's a very interesting story. The timing of it's interesting. We're so we're going to we're going to get into that. Um but but before we do, you know you guys know we love to start with these with our with our favorite things. So that's we're going to do favorite things segment. Um, and this is not spoiler free. You guys are not spoiler free. So if you haven't read the novella and you care to read it, um, definitely click off now because we're going to spoil the whole freaking thing for you. So, yeah, yes, we're going to yeah. start with favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Karen, why don't we start with your favorite thing of this novel? OK. All right. Mine was a character named. Get ready for this. Fred. <laughs> Fred. His name is Fred, you guys, but I'm telling you, this is the best character Stephanie Meyer has um, written uh, since uh, my lovely, beautiful, and perfect Rosalie. Okay, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. We, we've upgraded. We've upgraded I mean, Every for book Rosalie. she gets better, girl. <laughs> every book she gets better. I can't wait for her to be the only thing I like about the final book. I can't wait. I'm, I'm, pr- I'm calling it now. I'm going to read the final book and be like, everything sucked except for her. Anyways, Fred, second best character in the all of Twilight. Y'all, this is this is Fred, okay? Fred joins this coven, okay? You remember from Eclipse, Victoria's building this coven to go army, vampire army attack the, the Cullens, right? This is what's happening mm-hmm. in the but last book we read. Fred is a member of the coven, all right? Just like with the Cullens, this coven has 
some vampires with extra special powers and some vampires with regular ass powers like they're beautiful like that's their power right just just like the cullens they have this fred has an extra special power fred's extra special power is being completely repulsive y'all y'all okay his extra special power is making you feel uncomfortable by his presence okay and let me tell you, let me, t and, and the, the main character kind of realizes this and uses him as like a shield. She knows if she's around him, no one's going to fuck with her because no one's going to come up to Fred because he's so off-putting, right? So she's like, I'm going to tolerate the off-putting to have a shield. Okay, y'all, it's literally, <laughs> he's, his, his power is being off-putting and yet he has more riz than any of these other characters. Like, you're just going to have to trust me on that. When we get to the summary, it will make more sense. But like, it's just, it, it's the kind of like, like, chaotic thing that you would find in like role play world you know this type of character yeah. they are the worst character ever they are the most off-putting they are the most annoying character but but they are played by an attractive white face claim and they're a little bit kind of like on the dom top side so everyone loves them mm -hmm. it don't matter it don't matter about anything else everyone loves them because they do those things that's fred in this book <laughs> Fred is proof that Steph G. Meyer doesn't know how to write a character. I mean, I mean. <laughs> that a little bit more. It's kind of true. Like, he is supposed to be this repulsive, repugnant character. And yet. And yet. The, the, and best, yet. the best Byronic boy of all the Byronic boys in Twilight, of which there are many you know. There are, there yeah, are, there are. yeah. Uh, but of course, Fred didn't make it into the movie, so anyone who does he did not enjoy this novella, uh, it, it missed out on the wonderfulness that is Fred. But yeah. he did run away. Like we'll talk. Like no, like spoiler. But he ran away, so he's out there in the Twilight universe somewhere. Yes. Should Stephanie Meyer decide to return us to that world? Yeah. So if you ever find yourself in some kind of um vampire role play. You could totally just make Fred because he exists in the world. Yeah. Like he's out there somewhere doing his Fred thing. Doing his Fred <laughs> delicious thing. Yeah. So that was my favorite thing about, about this novella. Um, Landon, what was your favorite thing? I'm not going to be secretive about the fact that I didn't particularly like this novella. So it is not a surprise that the thing that I liked most about this novella was my girl Jane, we who know shows Jane. up. <laughs> we know I love Jane. I think she's been my favorite thing for like two books now. Uh, she is just this sweetie little thing that looks at you and then you feel pain. Uh, and I just think that that's such a great character. Uh, she <laughs> comes in with her badass self and and we get to find out a little bit more about the Volture, right? Uh, and we get to see Jane kind of laying down the badass law that she is yeah so yeah i i appreciated the the moment of being like hey i know and care about that character that's nice <laughs> <laughs> yes jane does get a very cool moment um in in this novella that's only implied to have happened in the uh yes. regular books but you see it here so she does get a very so if you're a jane fan if you think that's like the coolest Twilight side character, um, it's worth reading this novella. Yeah. But for those of you who haven't read it or did read it, but it was perhaps long ago, it was scrubbed from your brain. Uh, let's talk <laughs> about the second, the short second life of Brie Tanner and what exactly it is about. So uh, strap in, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Brie Tanner is a is a newborn vampire in Seattle. Uh, and her this really summarizes her experience as part of the Seattle newborn army. Um, so during a regular hunt, she is out hunting, having very little clue of what being a vampire is, only knowing this thirst for human blood, when she comes across three other newborn vampires. And having never met a vampire previous to them, they all kind of befriend one another, and that is where she meets Diego, who is this strong, higher-ranked boy, 
Uh, and throughout the night, night, they fall in love. <laughs> uh, and there is this very beautiful, lovely scene as they are waiting for the sun to rise to perhaps destroy them. Uh, and they discover that instead of burning it together like they thought they would, uh, they instead just simply sparkle. Uh, they've also learned that things like wooden stakes don't kill them and all of these things that they thought about being vampires was actually just a lie. Uh, which is this idea of betrayal because the only other vampire that they really know, Riley, has lied to them. Uh, so they come together, Bree and Diego, and grow uneasy and unsure of these dynamics that are happening in Seattle and the lying that is happening from Riley. Uh, Bree and Diego doubt Riley's intentions as to what is happening and why all of these vampires are gathering here and start to talk to other newborns about it. Diego confronts Riley about their ability to survive in the sunlight and all the lies that he is told and uh, doesn't return. Seems to be sent off to a mission of some sort and Bree is frightened and confused, but Riley, but goes along trusting Riley still uh, as they, he starts preparing them for the battle with the upcoming Cullens, claiming that uh, for four days a year, it is safe for a vampire to walk in the sunlight. Uh, he tells Bree that he sent Diego uh, as a reconnaissance mission, and that's where he's gone with her. And we hear a lot about this her and us Eclipse readers know that this is Victoria, but of course they can't know anything about Victoria. So there's just this mystery of who her is amongst the other vampires. Uh, it is promised that they'll be that Diego and her will be reunited shortly. Um, but of course, it's implied that that might not actually come to fruition. Uh, after much squabbling and talking and the politicking of vampire the day of the battle arrives and fred also known as freaky fred uh is uh who is of course had this repulsive shield amongst him tries to convince brie that this is all lies and they need to get the fuck out of here and brie because of her undying love for diego uh, even though suspecting that Riley and Victoria's intentions are lying about what is actually happening, uh, refuses to leave. However, Fred, being the generous boy that he is, decides that he will wait a day up in Canada for her should she decide to change her mind. Uh, there is then when Bree overhears Jane from the Volturi come in talking about how there must have been a deal made uh, and that Riley and Victoria must destroy the Cullens. And that is the only way that they will be able to live and the other newborns will be able to live if they, in fact, achieve this goal. The newborns come to the battlefield and Bree discovers that the newborns are not as, success as successful as they think. Um, and the combined efforts of the Cullen family, as well as the werewolves, uh, have destroyed the other newborns because Riley and Victoria are nowhere to be seen. She also realizes that Diego is actually been dead this whole time. Uh, <laughs> she finds no trace of him actually ever being at the battle, but she sees these two kind vampires who tell her to cover her eyes offer her safety, try to protect her as the Valtori come, uh, and the rest of the Olympic coven arrive along with Bella Swan, but that is when the Volturi show up. And even though Bree is struggling with the scent of this human nearby, she manages to keep it under wraps, but watches, but it is, is tortured under Jane's gaze, and uh, gets information, gives information about the newborn army and the creation of them and the purpose of them. And even though the Cullens try and attempt to keep her alive, it is determined that instead 
she is to be killed mm -hmm. um she thinks towards edward some other information specifically about fred and some other things that she knows and then felix executes her although there is this beautiful moment where edward like she hears edward saying close your eyes but we know that he's telling bella that she doesn't mm -hmm. know that though so she closes her eyes and accepts her death for what it is and that is the sweet short second life of brie turner and if that was confusing that's because the novel is confusing <laughs> We're gonna it get is just <laughs> it is just a series of scenes connected with a small through line. <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, Levi just brought me some um some bowl peanuts, y'all. They are as spicy as they look. Um they're very Levi. delicious. They're very delicious. Love Levi for that. Um He says they're not that spicy. To... They're a bit spicy, but they're really good. Oh, some okay. things that I wanted to speak about, though, is this, is that the fact that it's a novella, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. very, very short. I think it's 157 pages yeah, or something the, like the that. Yeah, the audiobook version is literally, like, half of what the other, like, Twilight yeah. audiobooks are. I think I've, I think it was, like, four or five hours or something, and I always listen on, like, a little bit faster speed. I want to say that I finished it in less than four hours. It is very short. It is not a huge time commitment, um, like reading the whole Twilight series. Yeah. And again, talking about why this was created. Oh, this yeah, the timeline. I just wanted to make sure we timeline, clarify yeah. the, the timeline before we go to that. So you have to remember, like, the books came out and the movies were coming out. And basically, you had, like, the third movie right so the movie mm -hmm. version of eclipse and all the books had been done been written by then that's when this novella comes out because it's actually written yeah. after all the books but it's but it, all the movies hadn't released yet so it's kind well, of like this extra little thing it's... for for eclipse yeah so the timeline of the movies is is so vastly different than like with Harry Potter and the Hunger Games that we mm -hmm. were dealt with. Breaking Dawn was still not officially out. Mm -hmm. It had been written, it had been sent to publishers and we were looking for the buildup of things, but it wasn't officially out yet. But Eclipse the movie was coming out. And as like a way to get people interested and re-tapped in um, and excited about it, uh, Steffi Meyer was going to release an encyclopedia about the world of vampires. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, she was going to include this short story of Brie Tanner and was very insistent to include it because she felt that it gave a lot of context and ideas as to what was happening during Eclipse because a lot of the problems with Eclipse was that we were told all of this stuff was happening. We didn't get to see it. Yes. Uh, and so the movie director as well as the publishers, as well as her editors, kind of teamed up and it was convinced Stephanie Meyer to release this novella on its own rather than a part of the uh, idea, uh, the illustrated guide. And um, because of that, it like, it, it was going to tie into the movie Eclipse. They have some Easter eggs, they show clips of like this movie, especially around Brie or this book, especially around Brie within the movie of Eclipse, and then also focus on her character in that final battle. Uh, so it is like this through line for all of the things kind of trying to connect yeah, the dots so, as this. So just was. to be just to be clear, the Eclipse movie or sorry, the Eclipse book came out in 2007. Yes. The Breaking Dawn book came out in 2008. The short Second oh, Life of Brie that? Tanner came out in um, in 2010. Oh, okay. okay. I was confused and then the on that. Yeah, so, so this, I mean, it was after everything. And then the Eclipse movie um, came out in 2010. So this came out with the Eclipse movie in 2010 after all the books had been written. Yes, okay. That makes yeah. sense. Oh, and 2010, which was the same. Okay. Yeah. Which, okay. That yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So all the books had been done in 2008. And then 2010 was the Eclipse movie and then this novella. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And, so, and yeah, that it was there was to before... give context for the movie. That's the whole point. Yeah. 
And at this point, too, she hadn't released any other written work. Host, I think, came out, which was their, her next, was going to attempt to be her next uh, and then no one cared about that. <laughs> it's still one of my favorites, actually. I actually enjoyed the host. Uh, That's so funny. Unpopular opinion. Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of things attached to that. But yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, yeah. So important to recognize that, that this this was supposed to give context and to be buy back, like buy back in, especially after the fall of Breaking Dawn, a lot of the fandom was not thrilled about the book Breaking Dawn. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, been, it was like two two years after that. So like, yeah, that makes sense that the book fandom would be kind of dead at that point. Yeah. We, we were trying to buy back fandom. in yeah. with this novella. Uh, and so that and is I what do happened. Think that, and... and I do think her publishers were right to say like, this deserves to be on its own. Um, yes. We'll talk about kind of like why that is. That'll become clear why that is when we start getting into some of our analysis of the book. But I do think if it had been kind of hidden inside of the encyclopedia, like it wouldn't have done this story justice because there's some really um, mm -hmm. there's some really interesting things going on here. Now, unfortunately, this book didn't do what they hoped it would do. It didn't really help with the book fandom for, for a couple of reasons. But there is some interesting stuff here. I can see why the publishers thought it might work absolutely is supposed to like it it was better than having it in the encyclopedia the problem was stephanie meyer's writing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like at the end of the day this the this story did not have a substance to be an entire novel on its own which is great that it kept as a novella uh and also great that it was kept out of the encyclopedia, because I think if we had been bogged down with fiction in the encyclopedia, that would have not done well. But right. this story proves that Stephanie Meyer's writing is very juvenile. Mm -hmm. And she lacks world building. Which we've kind of been saying from the beginning, like the the Twilight books are really about like is literally just a love story between a teenager and a vampire. There really isn't much thought into the world and uh and this kind of this book kind of proves it or this novella kind of proves it because um it it just it just complicates it more like if you try to make it all make sense you're gonna have to come up with so many fandom theories like it's just not gonna work it's not gonna work i mean this this book this novella can be boiled down into ins the tropes of insta love mm -hmm. and miscommunication about vampires mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like the fact that makes this book doable or any story here exists is that brie met diego and after spending eight hours together was yeah. head over heels in love with him yeah. which like I, I think because we don't get as immersive or as like rich and it's hard to call Edward and Bella's love story rich and immersive, but it <laughs> but is compared. comparatively to Brie, to Brie and Diego, mm -hmm. uh, it, because you care so little about these characters and because it is so instant and there is no buildup and no real drama in the short time that they spend together. It, it, it's really tough to like have that emotional buy-in at least it was for me and then you have Bree for most of the book worrying about Diego's whereabouts as well as like just being confused on what it is to be a vampire yeah I, I think I think like you have to you have to kind of logic your way into buying it right because the um the character Bree has only been a vampire for three months at kind of the start of the main events of the book. And she will speak about herself as if she is three months old. Like to her, her previous human life is so inconsequential. She can barely remember it. It's a completely different life. Like she does not, she considers herself a three month old person. And and, and has been isolated. Like yeah, because and she's of been, everything. She was isolated for a lot of that because when she was originally turned, so she was turned by Victoria, just like all the other Seattle people, but she um she didn't immediately find the coven. Like there was a mishap, right? So so she's on her own for a bit. 
before she officially joins the coven at the beginning of the the novella. So um, you have this situation where where mentally she is very young. She thinks of herself as very young. So their their love story is uh, in some ways even more childish than Bella and Edward. And you have to you have to logic yourself into accepting that by accepting fully everything that she says about her status as a three month old. That's yes. how you'd have to do it. But like, it is also hard to then conceptualize that because there is like this massive life changing love that she meets. He then disappears and leaves. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so it is. It, it, and she and obviously she spends a lot of time then worrying about him um, mm-hmm. and is manipulated because of that worry. And yes. it's it's very it's very juvenile. It's yeah. It's not. The characters don't particularly stand out. There isn't chemistry. Um, I I know that because it's a novella with a specific ending that's tied into the into the novel that we already know the results. Yeah, but there's also like there is no room for surprise. You know what's happened to Diego, mm-hmm. right? Like we as the audience are not worried about what happened to Diego because we know that he's already been murdered that Riley is like feeding her lies and it's very very hard to buy into the world because a lot of the world building that is this story is I feel like supposed to give us has already been built yeah yeah, because there's already canon events of Breaking Dawn at this point. So, like, we know mm-hmm. what ends up happening, you know, by the end. Um, and, and you also, you know what happens at the end of this book, not just in relation to Diego, but also in relation to Brie herself. So it's 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 almost like, why get invested? Which I think is interesting. but I, And I think you could get invested if there had been an interesting character built. Yeah, but right? it's just Bella again. But she's just, but yeah. she's just Bella again. So you and don't. even younger Bella, an yeah. even younger and more naive Bella. Yeah, yeah. But she's um, the same archetype, the exact same archetype again. So you but don't. But yeah, invested. we're we're watching Riley lie about like, oh, these are the four days that we're allowed in the sunlight. Yeah. When we know that that's not true. Yeah. So there is no, there is, even though that this story was supposed to serve the purpose of like expanding the world of Twilight and understanding of Twilight, it doesn't do that successfully. Yeah. Um, and so like and the in, purpose mind, of the like, story fails. We're, we're staying all this stuff. And I, I didn't hate the novella. Okay. I, you yes. know, I'm not, I'm not on the Bella Edward train. I don't really care about it from that aspect. So what if they're not in it? But there's still a lot of flaws in this novel. Um, we are going to get to some things that are more interesting, but just yes. over overall, um, I can just I can see why this didn't catch on the way they hoped it would. Even though there's a lot of cool elements in here that we're going to get into. Yes, it, it felt like a money grab, right? Yeah. Like, of there yeah, is yeah. one other thing of like, oh, here the book t- the book is or not the books, but the movies are at its peak. Mm-hmm. Here have a story that is in line with the movie that's going to be coming out later this year right um so but this 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 new novel did do something world world building wise accidentally that proves you true karen do you want to talk about your hot take for this this episode okay okay this this is the mildest hot take yet because i've already actually talked about it but this novella proves me right What vampires believe is not what vampires are in this world. We are constantly told by Edward, and it's implied that the rest of the Cullens believe this too, that vampires in the Twilight universe are solitary creatures. They do not come together into covens normally. They come together in very small groups. If at all, it is rare to see multiple vampires together. It was the fact that Victoria had her two little boyfriends, right? That was rare. The What the Cullens are doing, super rare. The Volturi, super rare. That's how they were able to get powerful. Um, even when vampire armies are built, they don't last long. They break up very quickly, right? All of this stuff we're told. All of this stuff we're told. And yet, 
We don't mean no solitary vampires in Twilight. I've talked about this. Where are they? If they're so common, Rhi, where are they? Where are they? Bree, who who believes she is only three months old, uh, is searching consistently yeah. and constantly for a companionship. Yeah, and she and as soon as she meets the first vampire that she has any sort of romantic or sexual attraction to, she pair bonds with him instantly. Yes. Instantly. Okay? And this is what we continue to see throughout Twilight. In fact, the only vampire that we see that resists pair bonding is Edward in his arrogance takes him years and years to pair bond until he finds Bella. There's no other vampire that's like this. It's just him. It's just him. Mm -hmm. So this is a lie that vampires in this world tell themselves. It's not true. Vampires are just as subject to pair bonding as any other mammal. In fact, more so, it feels like. Sometimes. In some right? ways, they are. And not even just pair bonding, but cousin bonding. Because yeah. like that's the thing, too, is that finding mates, quote unquote, is not unusual, as much unusual in Twilight. Like, they do talk about how James and Victoria were mates. They do talk about how each of the Cullens have found their perfect match. It is the concept of the more family dynamics but they all the want Volturi. families every single they one. one and they find them uh-huh victoria too. and james have laurent come in and they are some fearsome threesome you have the cullens who find theirs you have the volturi who find one another and then build <sighs> tier systems down yeah. and adopt almost children that they are then responsible for and are able to order around and then you have riley with this entire group of newborns yeah. that are interacting and finding relationships and commingling with one another. Right. And, and and yes, some of the the new vampires do end up leaving the coven, but they don't leave that coven because they 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 dislike the community. They leave that coven because they realize they actually can survive in the sun. They've had a leader that's lied to them. That's why they leave. Mm-hmm. So this whole idea then, that vampires can't survive in groups is just wrong. Well, and then also to just like point that out even more, Fred leaves and specifically asks someone to come with him. Yes, he invites another. Because he doesn't want to be by himself. Because if it, they were naturally solitary creatures or don't want to be covened up, he would have just left. But instead, he's like, yeah. Bree, I'm inviting you. And when you say no, I'm still going to even wait a day. Yeah. Yeah, because it's just not true. And like, okay, this is like where Twilight, where Twilight is so, um, is so heavily influenced by Stephanie Meyer's unconscious biases that like it hurts, right? Because this is a very... Um, american thing to believe that humans are meant to live in these tiny like nuclear family groups they're meant to just rely on their spouses they're not meant to rely on extended family networks da 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 but this this nuclear family concept that most americans live in now is not typical throughout human society and it's very new even for us and our culture and so i just yeah. feel like we are seeing through the writing versus what the characters believe that they believe the the vampire version of a nuclear family which is which is like pair bonding only or, or singular right mm -hmm. is what's natural but then it's obviously not because when even if it is natural then the vampires would not be doing the actions that they're doing they wouldn't be having the feelings that they're having they, they just wouldn't be interacting with each other in this way at all and yet there's not a single there's not a single example where they interact in the way that edward says they naturally are that never happens and it, it's never. even in this novella even in this novella and i'm guarantee it's gonna happen again in breaking dawn if it doesn't happen in breaking dawn okay i don't know i'll eat like three of these gross bean boozled things like i'm just so convinced i'm so convinced it'll yeah it'll happen differently in breaking dawn i i think that it it's yeah, and I think that, like, something that this novel does so well, without, like, going to that point that we're going to talk about later, is that it does give us the opportunity to show and not tell what mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. much of vampire lore is told, is told to us, the readers, and to Bella through Edward's perspective. Um, But 
it is disappointing when there isn't even a singular example. Because, like, even then, Riley is doing this because he is in love with Victoria and wants to make connection with Victoria. Like he wants to be every... her second. He wants to be her second boyfriend, and she's not that interested. And so he's like doing all this craziness to try to get in her good graces. And and maybe there's an argument to be said that like stephanie meyer's idea of these like nuclear families these pair bondings and those are not like that it's supposed to be it's not supposed to be a congregation of those two those duo relationships that gather together and form families like there could be an argument for that and that's like very natural for vampires to like find a mate but what is unmatched unnatural is for multiple mates to live together under one roof or whatever maybe but that's not really but, what edward says when you look at the text of what he says he makes it seem like the ability for this many vampires to pair bond at all is unusual that like vampires don't keep mates for these long lengths of time that doesn't happen but we're also lied to about the fact that like powers are supposed to be rare yeah and then they're freaking not and they're not. <laughs> it proven in, in this. It proven here in this novella. Right. So, right. I mean, honestly, yeah. it's so, honestly it's so anime. It's so anime where it's like, oh, no one's this strong, and every season there's someone stronger. But then the powers are cool, so more characters keep showing up with powers because it's freaking cool. It doesn't. You can say it's rare all you want, but it's cool, so they keep putting it. Writers keep putting it in. Duh. There are contradictions of the things that happen, and I and I think that that. I I wonder because I have read Midnight Sun, but I haven't read Midnight Sun in the con and and uh Karen has not yet. Yeah, but no. I haven't I I didn't read it in the context of like diving into and making connections. A part of me wonders if at some point in time Stephanie Meyer goes back and tries to rewrite her world building as a Edward flaw. Because it's Edward who's telling us all of this. That it's I mean, like, that's the oh, only Edward's way you could write around it. Like, because because she's not doing um, world building and outlining to begin with, which is fine, by the way. She never claims to do it. So I'm not saying that this is, I'm not saying this is a negative. I'm just saying this is, this is what happens because of what her writing process is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's, that would be like the only way to write yourself out of it is just to say, well, Edward's ideas are incorrect. Yeah, that this is an Edward problem. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I think that this novella undermines even that. Yeah, it does. Because there there are ideas, uh, like Edward's ideas are kind of the foundation of what we're going on with this novella. And then there are things within the novella that contradict that. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, okay. So thank you. I want to say thank you to the short... Um, second life of Brie Tanner for validating something I've been saying since like what the second book was when I came up with this or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I appreciate that. Um, I like it when I'm right. So uh, this was enjoyable for me, <laughs> but there was other stuff that this book gave us um, that we're going to go into. So, yeah. So let's talk about the things that this book gave us that were positive because mm-hmm, Karen mm-hmm. is right. Karen enjoyed it. I what it's whatever. But there, there are opportunities for world world building that existed in this that that did flush out some things. Yeah, yeah. And so the first one is confirmation about the Volturi, right? Uh, that that we are hinted at, and it is deeply implied that the Volturi, uh, or played some part in the attack of Victoria and the newborns. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, them showing up at the nick of time was not a like accident. Obviously, that was planned, but it is very much confirmed that there is a conversation with Jane when coming in and saying, Nope, you have five days to go and kill the Collins or we kill you. Mm-hmm. And and truly orchestrating and putting pressure on Victoria and Riley and the newborn army yep. uh, as a attack, as like a proxy war against the Cullens, that, that they I, truly are like the villains. And I liked it. I liked it, the little show not tell element, right? Yeah. Because ever since the end of the second book where we meet the Volturi and the Volturi try to recruit 
Edward and Alice, it's kind of been implied in the in the third book in Eclipse that the Volturi feel threatened by the Cullens. They think the Cullens are, are too large of a coven, um, too, too desirable of a coven to be able to attract mm. other vampires. Like that's implied throughout Eclipse starting at the end of, uh, of New Moon. And the scenes that you get with the Volturi in this novella prove that like, yes, that is exactly what was happening. Well, and also like there was this, like for me, what really like this helped with is something I, it's such a small detail that I had a problem with, but it was this concept of the, of the Volturi coming in at the end of Eclipse and being like, it has been four months and Van- and Bella is still a human. And then having like this big fucking fit about that uh <laughs> when like it's vampire time these are immortal he- people like yeah. four months is the blink of like we the blink of an eye it's not supposed <laughs> to be meaningful at all and so why after four months do they have this big problem with it yeah. and now we have the context of being like oh it's because they never let it go right like those it, four otherwise... months were yeah, because it we're just active. feels like in the book that they care because we're supposed to care because Bella cares. It doesn't really yeah. make sense for them to care. But it's like, oh, they never stopped caring. They never yeah. took their eye off of that. Yeah. And then like and then we're like reminded of it four months later, which is right. nothing in the t- in the terms of vampires. For them, they're like, oh, we're salivating and waiting for you to mess up mm-hmm. so that we can attack, so mm-hmm. that we can have reason for it. It makes way more and sense. This- this confirms that like the chess pieces are moving outside of just the cullen house yeah 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 which makes Uh, sense so it's good and also i think does world build for like this conflict that's going to happen in breaking dawn that oh it's not just the cullens are out of sight out of mind for the volturi because it definitely felt that way in new moon Mm-hmm. But now it's like, oh no, our eyes are on you, and mm-hmm. we are, yeah, we are watching constantly. <laughs> uh huh. Yes, for sure. So it gave us that con- that confirmation, which was nice. Yeah. Also, showing some off-screen events instead of telling us, because a lot of this stuff that happens in Eclipse, we learn about it through like because edward is telepathic and because alice can see the future Mm -hmm. edward's able to just kind of like explain it to bella and therefore explain it to us right um we don't really see a lot of this stuff we just have to trust that what edward said is what's going on it feels like a lore like i for those of you who have ever played like D, it's like a lore dump within yeah. the books it's just like oh someone rolled a high check and so here is all this information that you need to know that's been happening off screen and it really is truly like the number one thing that you're told as a writer to not to show not tell and we are told we get to see it mm-hmm. is it do we love it i don't but we get to see it it's better awesome. than the lore dump it's better than the lore dump Yes. And I think also does do the purpose what this novella was trying to do. And that is allow for the movie to show and not tell. Yes. Because this was not built for, this was not written for the reading fans. This was built for the movie fans. And so we get these little, and we'll talk about this when we actually do the the watch throughs of all the movies, but we get to see these little scenes of Riley meeting Brie, of uh, of things happening, of, of tensions building in the background that Bella isn't aware of. Mm-hmm. This, this mm-hmm. allows for that. Yes, for sure. So that was nice. Um, next thing oh, is, oh, whoa, happened? we went way far. I don't know why it went all to the end. Okay. All right. So anyways, next, guess what? This book had action scenes, you guys. It's a short little novella, but it had a real action scene. And that made my heart happy um, since we didn't get one last book and I felt so freaking cheated. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still, the, the action scene kind of comes halfway in. It's still not great, but we get something. Which but you is, know what? It just was kind better, of... It's better than Eclipse and being told. That's they, true. Because in, in an Eclipse, they insult me by telling me, you didn't want to see that action scene anyway. What happened to you, Bella, was way more interesting than this action scene that you that we tease when you don't get to see it. That's true. We get to see it. We got to see it. And, and Stephanie Meyer is 
decent at writing action. She is like, like your, your hypothesis of that was correct because we get to see at least a little bit of it. Yeah. And it wasn't um, bad. It wasn't bad. You guys, why like, she, why she continues to be reluctant about it. We won't know, but it's not bad. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Okay. And last but, uh, but not least it's a cute little love story. Okay. So one of the positives of this love story uh, between Brie and Diego is because it's a novella and because it's so short, I found myself not getting bored. So during the Twilight yeah. books, especially the first one, there are long stretches of just pining and um, and uh, and wanting and, and all of these things that uh, that if you're not super invested in the couple are boring. Well, we skip all that in this. <laughs> and so you don't get a chance to get bored with Brie and Diego the way that you might feel about Edward and Bella if you're not super invested in them. Stephanie Meyer loves insta-love. And she this do. happened. And as long as you're okay with it and you accept it, it's great. Because it's cute. Yeah. Like, we get to, we get to be in Brie's head as she falls in love. With a very cute boy. And also, he's not pictured on here, but we also get Diego, who is yeah. a very good character and also a character of color. Yeah. So, okay. Um, are we talking about that on this slide? Or are we talking about that on the next uh, yeah. slide? I have things to say. I don't say. think I have a thing. I didn't have a thing for him on okay, the okay. other I side. I'm going to say my things about Diego. Okay. So this is in, this is in, my, in my mind, in Karen's made up world that's not real of what happened. Okay. So this is what I think happened. So, you know, in Twilight, how all the vampires are basically um, white and whenever the movie started, Stephanie Meyer was very adamant that they had to have that type of appearance, right? That, yeah. that this was very important to her for, for um, a visual contrast point. That's how she imagined them. Um, and and the the movie people had to fight to have What's-His-Face be black. I can't... The, the Victoria's other... Yeah, Laurent, right? Um, these are... Sorry, I'm just talking a lot, but I'm still eating them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, okay. it's all good. So, so the movie people had to fight to say like, like Stephanie, you got to You got to cast one non-white vampire. This is ridiculous. This is going to look so stupid when we put it in a movie. Okay. Look and, and it would have, it would have looked so <laughs> stupid. And, uh, and so that we get black Laurent and what in my heart, this is what I believe happened. I believe years pass. Stephanie Myers is thinking of this and she finally says, you know what? I think they're right, and I was being racist. Fuck it, Diego's Latino. I think that's what happened. And I think that's great, and I love to see that growth. I don't know if that's real, but you know what? Diego is a great character. You know what Brie and Diego are? They are if Bella and Jacob was vampires. That's what I think is a similar type of pairing for Stephanie Meyer. As yes. Diego is, is yeah. much is much more Yeah, he's uh, a Jacob type. He's, not, he's a Jacob yeah. type. Yeah, he's a Jacob type, right? I'm not <laughs> saying Diego is Jacob and that Brie <laughs> is Bella. I'm saying the no, type he's, he's and, yes. and the, the, like the, the friend like it's it's definitely more friendship and loving yeah. and sweet and it's very young. It's very cute. It's not this yeah. big passionate, I feel super drawn to him. It is. It is cute. They, their love, Diego, their love forms through a shared experience, not yeah. through instant attraction. Yes, and yeah. and Diego is a good character, uh, and doesn't like the other thing that I'm very, I'm fairly surprised and pleased with, especially when it comes to Diego's, uh, that Stephanie Meyer made Diego a character of color, uh, is that he doesn't. He he is not then a uh he is not then his race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's <laughs> right? more to he, him. He, there's more like, to him. There is he she was just like, you know, it doesn't matter. We're just gonna put him in there. And I do appreciate that because yeah. I think that if this was a statement of uh or a reaction to backlash, that could have gone a very poor way. And it didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So very, I, I know it's I'm kind very of like happy we got that. 
Yeah, so I know it's kind of like <laughs> afterhand in a novella, and you can say like too little, too late, and you maybe are right about that. But you know what? I was you happy are. to see it when I was. Yeah, I was happy to see it. That I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So growth happens. Yeah, and this might be growth. It might be. We'll you know, it. I choose to believe it is. I choose to believe it is. <laughs> uh, so so yeah, that uh, these these were all like things that were like we were glad to receive from reading yeah. this book. But for everything we get, something must be taken away. <laughs> Y'all. <laughs> and there are things that just made us laugh. And also laugh cry <laughs> because of the ridiculousness of this book. And and this is nothing to do with the storyline or the plot line or anything. This is just the thing. It's all that lore. It's Stephanie all Meyer, lore stuff. It's a it's thing that Stephanie Meyer went, you know what? I'm going to. I'm going to build out my world. And this is things that I'm going to want to focus on. And the first one, the first one is perhaps the most ridiculous thing that has ever come out of the Twilight universe ever. You're not prepared for it. it is you don't know, you don't know. Ever come out of the Twilight, uh, Twilight universe. And there is this beautiful, cute, adorable scene in which our lovely main characters to start, decide to start kissing as one does. And then it's described as porcelain, rubbing against each other. Porcelain. I would like you to imagine two china plates. That's them kissing. <laughs> rubbing together. <laughs> the sounds that that makes, scraping across one another. And then I would like you to remember <laughs> all the times that Stephanie Meyer has referred to Bella and Edward kissing as Bella like being like he has very hard lips it's ve it's very hard and you're thinking oh it's just because he's a man and it's strong and it's tough and this is no it is because she is kissing and making out with a rock Bella licking rock literally <laughs> like I feel like a, I, I understand that diamonds are like the hardest essence on earth and stuff like that but like at least at least kissing a diamond is better than kissing porcelain. I feel like, uh, and and it there is a scene in which it truly is described as two porcelain lips making out with each other, and I just that's a choice she made. I want you to also keep in mind what this means for Edward's um evenings okay everyone in his house is pair bonded up everyone in his house is doing it all the time that's what we understand and, from edward and we under like we get that also yes. confirmed in breaking dawn yes. that it is constant and non-stop yes okay so i want you to understand what that means for the sounds that are invading edward's super hearing while he can't turn off the fact that he can hear all their thoughts okay it is it is clink 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 every night it is clink clink, clink. every night for edward it just or, or scraping yeah and i <laughs> and i understand that stephanie meyer does not want us to go this deep i get that <laughs> but we're there <laughs> and i i can't not I can't not take this information and apply it to the rest of her world. Because, like, no wonder, no wonder Edward, who, or not Edward, Bella, who has never had a kiss other than Edward, is so uncomfortable when Jacob kisses her because it's not like kissing rocks. There are other things that are problematic about that, but, like, even when they have, like, this moment of, like, when she's kind of enjoying it and he's not forcing himself upon her, it, it's it's no wonder it's nice because she's just been making out with a statue. I mean, time. I mean, like, poor thing. Poor thing. I It, it makes it, it brings it into sharp focus. Maybe why Edward feels how he feels about yeah. the weird like marriage sex dichotomy. Um, you know, maybe he like maybe on some level, it's literally like him being like, yeah, but you can't possibly like licking rocks, Bella. Like maybe it's literally that. And he just I, is I too much of a prude to come out and say it like that. But that's what he's thinking. There's a whole scene in Breaking Dawn 
that I think this adds context for and oh. changes my perspective of that scene. Okay. Well, we'll get there. I'm not going to, yeah. But I'm just like, wow. I didn't, I didn't need to know that. And now I can't not know it. Yeah. And now, now, now that we know, <laughs> now that we know we cannot go back, <laughs> we can't go back. It's, we can't. Well, yeah. This is this is unforgettable knowledge. Yes. <laughs> We've been cursed with this knowledge. Yes. I've I've never truly felt as cursed in this moment. In the moment <laughs> this, like in the moment in which I read this scene and was just like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. It's so stupid. But um, but guess what? There's more. <laughs> um there also is. sorry, go ahead. No, I was like, there is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <just> okay. <laughs> so, in in addition to the um the porcelain kissing, uh, there is also this kind of like, okay, the these vampires in this book are lied to. They're told that you have to stay in this bunker, you have to live in this bunker, basically underground, because the sun's gonna kill you, and they have to go through this process of finding out. <laughs> The sun doesn't kill them. It's kind of ridiculous because, like, what that means is essentially for months and months and months, they they never touched a sunbeam ever to still believe this. Which, yeah, like, which, like, just having consumed other vampire lore feels very unbelievable. Like, I'm thinking vampire diaries, right? I'm like, man, they all tried it. They all suffered the consequences because at least in there, the sun does hurt them. But they at least tried it. Yeah. Right? Like, why wouldn't you? I, but, like, the. Hey, Lunar. <laughs> Hi, Lunar. Oh, good. You missed the porcelain kissing. Oh, Lunar, good. That's what you've missed. <laughs> um, I, I think that there is this moment where they just. They're sitting there waiting for the sun to rise. And, like, what makes it worse is we, the audience, know. Mm -hmm. Like, we, the audience, know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because we've read Twilight. Mm -hmm. Because there's nobody that's reading this novella that's not read Twilight. No. So we know that they're going to just shine like a diamond. Mm -hmm. And they're just waiting. And then there is this moment in which they discover it. And it's just very funny. Yeah, they have a little freak out. Basically, they have a little freak out about, oh, my God, we sparkle and we're so beautiful. Oh, my gosh. Um, it's like, <laughs> it's it's well, like, then, it's so dumb. Sorry. I was going to say, and then they bring it up to Riley. And yeah. Riley's like, oh, yeah, it's for these four days. For these four days. You're just so lucky that for these four days a year, you're allowed to step in the sunlight. You don't burn, you shine. I guess the only the only way that they could believe that is if these vampires really are three months old and have lost every memory from their human life and don't remember that they went to school and learned how the sun works. Like, I don't... Which, like, is... <sighs> which, like, I have a problem with in that in general because it's like, no other vampire we know did that. As yeah. remembers everything. Like, yeah. the only one that we kind of know is Alice, but the reason we're given that is because she was in an insane asylum. Yeah, right. Like that—that that she was insane prior to becoming a vampire, and it's like this—it's hidden behind trauma, is what we're kind of told. But no, apparently it's normal when a vampire gets turned for their first like however long of life they don't even remember their human life. Apparently but that's God normal. Knows that every, God knows everybody else remembers. Yeah, but not but not these guys. It don't make no sense. It don't make no sense. It's fine. Also, we learned that uh, in order to have a power, you have to have a quirky personality. Basically. Or if you have a quirky <laughs> personality, you have a power. It's like one of those things where it's like, it's so um, obvious and easy to do as the writer if you're not putting any thought into it, which we know thought is not happening here. So basically every character that's interesting or that that um that that is considered an interesting character by the author is going to have a power and everyone that's considered boring by the author is not going to have a power um that's basically what's going on here um because that's how this coven just like how the cullens work where all of the ones that were supposed to connect with the most have a special power 
And it, this coven is like that too. All the characters we're supposed to connect with the most have a special power. Yeah. And it, it just, it, my theory is right, wrong, or indifferent. Uh, Stephanie Meyer doesn't know how to build three dimensional characters. Yeah. Without giving them a quirky personality. And in order to be like, oh, they they have a power and therefore they must be an important character and therefore we must give them a personality trait in which they must stand out. And this one, you know, is suave. And this one is Pixie Manic Dream Girl. And this one <laughs> is just the himbo we all know and love as Emmett. And it just is very interesting. Yeah, it's it's just it, it's it's very um it's just juvenile. It's just juvenile again, you know. And uh, and if and if you're okay with that sort of thing, then yeah. um then it's easy to overlook because a, a lot of media has that. But uh, but as soon as you start scratching the surface, it's like wait a second. Wait. It's just a nice second. to know. It's just nice to know that that even though Stephanie Meyer grew in some ways with this novel, as far as in, you know, acknowledging that people of color exist, uh, <laughs> that she also stayed the same. Yeah. And, and that her writing yeah. didn't change that much. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. It's nice to acknowledge that. <laughs> yeah, no, I couldn't have said it better. I couldn't have said it better. So, yeah. um, That was the short second life of Brie Tanner. Uh, a short, short, uh, a short thing for you. So I think, yes. I think we we ask the question that we ask every single time, and that is, uh, Karen, does this resonate? Nah, girl, it was only fun because it was short and different. It doesn't like it's not really. It's still I I. I I don't think I mean outside of of certain things I liked about New Moon and and a fun experience I had there. Like I just haven't found much about this series that that resonates with me and and I'm sure that uh that's why I could never become a Twilight girly even though it was like so popular and you know oh. I always have a desire to be keeping up with the zeitgeist and what's popular even if I don't like it, you know. Um but uh but yeah, I'm just seeing like as an adult all the reasons that I was never taken by this. Don't you worry. Don't you worry, Karen. Uh you'll you'll definitely resonate with Breaking Dawn. I don't believe you. I think I I think I think I'm gonna have a very mixed feeling of Breaking Dawn. Mixed feelings. I don't yeah. think you'll have mixed feelings at all. I think you'll have a I'll very, have one feeling. Very, you think I'll have one feeling? Okay. Strong feeling. We're gonna find out. We're gonna find out. <laughs> and it'll out. be resonation. You'll resonate. That's that's what that feeling will be. Oh. You'll be like, this is the this is me in a novel. That's oh. that's what I think of Breaking Dawn. That's what I think of. <laughs> So uh, so yeah no I did enjoy this but um I think I I, I think it, you know it's it's got a lot going for it being short makes it a positive having new mm -hmm. fresh characters um was positive for me and so that's why I thought overall it was enjoyable and 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 not a complete waste of my time like Eclipse was um but uh but yeah no it still it still didn't what about you Landon I know it's no secret you didn't like no. it but yeah no <laughs> <laughs> what in this resonates Nothing what, for what you. In this not, would speak to a thirty-year-old queer woman. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, there is there. No, it was. Um, I think this represents this book represents 2010 fandom. Oh, I think that that's what it represents. That we at that point in time would have digest anything, mm. and uh, would have appreciated it, and mm. that and that uh we just wanted more and more and more even if it was not great and uh i think that the i think it's very interesting because i think like something like this would never exist again mm. I mean, but it, it really was a different time it was like i'm trying to think obviously i am not immersed in the ya fandom like i was before but thinking of like the things that have really come and spoken to the people of YA and been like the YA fandom that I at least have knowledge of, thinking of like Heartbreakers and certain other TV shows and books, this wouldn't fly. Yeah. People would not go crazy over this like they no. did mm -mm. then. And and same thing with like the movie. Like it's very interesting how I feel like fandom has and fandom culture has 
aged with the people that in like didn't invent it because obviously fandom existed way before the Harry Potter Twilight Hunger oh, Games yeah. of our time. But I'm like, man, most of fandom I feel like is now still pointed towards like our age demographic and it doesn't exist in the way that it used to exist for the younger generation yeah yeah for sure for sure and i think that that's the that's the kind of things that this book makes me think about yeah very interesting thoughts um very interesting thoughts there hey blue by the way i see you just you wait a second we actually are going to play some sims 2 today um so yeah, I, I'll I'll explain I'll explain after we're finished with the podcast, which we're almost finished. So um so yeah um that's uh that short short second life of Brie Tanner closing thoughts and um and I don't think that this novella if you if you like Twilight this novella isn't a complete waste of your time. But you know what? If you're not a Twilight fan already, uh you've gotten enough from this podcast. You don't need to read it. <laughs> that's kind of my opinion. That's kind of my opinion uh on, on this if you're a twilight fan you've never read it yeah it's worth it's worth it but um but otherwise like you can skip it it don't matter so yeah here's where you can find us all right you guys so we are actually next month taking a little break from um from twilight and uh we are going to be talking about uh the last uh sailor moon crystal uh it's uh content finally okay we're going to be talking about sailor moon cosmos it was another part one part two movie okay so if you are interested in that make sure you come back it'll be one of our june episodes that we do i'll give you all a date once we get a little bit closer because i don't remember what it is but it's sometime in june <laughs> um also after uh after this today i'm gonna be playing some pleasant view uh Ooh. we've we're almost we started around back when we did the 500 um subscriber uh or 500 follower stream and i didn't finish it uh that day so we're gonna try to finish up that round but my main game right now is final fantasy 7 we played it all the way all last weekend so there are four episodes up on my youtube right now and we are gonna play some more of that tomorrow this is the og final fantasy 7 okay this will be the third no fourth final fantasy game we've done 100 percent run on on my channel okay so it'll be really fun. So that's the stuff where to find me. Um, Landon, Landon, where, sh where should people go looking for your stuff? You can find me at Land in Maine on Instagram and TikTok. Uh, you know, life's busy right now. So things are uh, slow there, but that's where you can find me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always appreciate the support. And then also you can catch me here on Interstage Window every so often. Yes. Well, enter stage window always, but Saturday yeah. on the street. Yeah, so not always because we, we, yeah, but it, at least like once or twice a month, pretty much. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. All right. All right, you guys. So um, that is our episode for today. Um, if you short are watching, sorry. Yeah, short, short and, sweet, and sweet, just like the novella. So, um, so if you're watching the recorded version of this on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe down below. We will be finishing all the rest of the Twilight books and movies. Um, you know, we'll be almost done with it, I think, by the end of this year. But I'll probably bleed into 2025 a little bit because, because uh, like yeah. Midnight Sun's real freaking long. <laughs> and so, so, but definitely come back in July for yes. Karen's, uh, for Karen's reaction to Breaking Dawn because I do yeah. think that is going to be the ultimate reaction of this entire Twilight series. Oh my God. Best reaction for my birthday month. I love that. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so don't forget to like, comment, subscribe down below, all of that stuff. Um, and of course, as always, you guys, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye.